Um, I promise you, you're going to get a break after this. Um, okay, you ready? All right. So I'm going to quickly, I'm going to introduce these speakers, and then I'm going to let them take it away. So um, Shane Greenstein will be the moderator here. And Shane is the um, Martin Marshall Professor of Business Administration at uh, Harvard Business School. He teaches in technology operations and the management unit, and is the former co-chair of the HBS Digital Initiative and former co-director of the program on the economics of digitization at the National Bureau of Economics uh, Research. Great conference they have every summer, by the way, that economics and digitization, although it has another name now, I guess. But um, it'll be interviewing uh, Dr. Oren Etzioni, who was the uh, chief executive officer at AI2 from its inception until September 30th, 2022. He now serves as an advisor and board member for AI2 and the technical director of the AI2 Incubator. He's Professor Emeritus at the University of Washington and a venture partner for the um, Madrona Venture Group uh, since 2000. Uh, his many awards include the AAAI Fellow and Seattle's Geek of the Year. Um, I assume that's, a, that's an important one. I like that one. Um, he's founded several companies, including Faircast, which was acquired by Microsoft. He's written over 200 technical papers, as well as commentary on AI for the New York Times, Wired, and Nature. Um, he helped to pioneer meta-search, online comparison shopping, machine reading, and open information extraction. Um, so much more, uh, really, on both of them. Um, but I'm going to leave it to, this, uh, to, to have this great conversation now. Thanks. All right, thank you, Scott. I uh, really appreciate you uh, running a tight ship and uh, keeping us on schedule. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go real tight here. Um, uh, it's it's great to have you uh, at TPI. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, let's start with um, just your view of artificial intelligence and how does it differ from automation and what does it mean to have a human in the loop uh, and why is uh, automation, AI, is it, do they have anything to do with one another? And how do you think about that? Uh, th thanks, Shane. Uh, we were going to have a fireside chat, chat, but this question is so good and inclusive. I'll just deliver a 30-minute soliloquy and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be done. No, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but you did touch a, on a lot of things. First of all, my favorite definition of AI is that AI stands for augmented intelligence, very much uh, human in the loop. As for automation versus AI, th that's a surprisingly subtle question. So uh, the quintessential example of automation is the calculator, right? You put in some set of numbers, it uses an algorithm to give a response with superhuman speed and uh, accuracy, and it's run by uh, an algorithm that's built into the calculator. When you think about AI, we typically aren't able to create an algorithm to do, to do what it does. So as was mentioned earlier, it learns its uh, algorithm, its approach from uh, data, from very extensive data sets. And as such, uh, it's much more nuanced, but also much more surprising and unpredictable, right? A calculator uh, will always do its job. It doesn't have hallucinations or hallucinations, <laughs> and our, our new generative AI models uh, really do. So, so there's some important distinctions there. But the thing that I want to emphasize is that both are still tools. So some of the AI alarmism, especially the most extreme form about AI taking over the world and such, assumes that AI becomes a being with its own uh, will with its own initiative and so on. And um, I, I don't believe that's the case. I believe that it's a powerful tool. It may be difficult to control. Imagine a, uh, a power saw, right? Or uh, a modern car, right? Uh, we, you know, we have issues with these cars. They pollute, they have accidents, etc. So it's a very sophisticated and powerful tool. It's intelligent in some sense, AI, but it's not autonomous by any means, right? Think of uh, when eventually we'll have self-driving cars, they'll reduce accidents, they'll also make mistakes, but one thing they won't do is tell you where to go. You still tell the car, here's where I wanna go. I could continue, but uh, <laughs> let me stop there. I mean, so in that sense, generative AI doesn't really change your views at all. I think generative AI is remarkably powerful and uh, creates 
a new set of threats. I actually disagreed with some of the comments earlier. It's always nice to hearken back to historical examples and, and so on, but I actually think we are dealing uh, with something quite different. That said, generative AI still is uh, a tool with very, very limited uh, autonomy, if any. All right, let's just, uh, let, let's jump into policy because, uh, you know, that's what this crowd loves. Um, most of us only get to fantasize of what we would say if we were in front of the president uh, and we got our three minutes to lobby. You, you had the privilege to do that uh, and spend uh, some time in roundtables organized by the White House about AI. Uh, what, what did you get to say in your three minutes? Uh, we all want to know. Uh, uh, it, it was an honor to sit with uh, the president. He was about as far from me as you are. And I was impressed that he was uh, focused, engaged, uh, uh, sharp, even, even witty. Um, somebody told him that um, uh, banning facial recognition uh, is uh, something that um, AOC, and I'm blocking in the name, an extreme conservative senator, both... Uh, agreed on, and he was like, help me father. I was yes. like, can't can there really be such a thing? Uh, it was very funny. I advocated for two things. One is uh, the use of AI in assistive technology. I think there's an interesting fact that, uh, and it was expressed by uh, Danielle Lee earlier, the weaker you are at something, the more AI can help you, right? And um, if you have trouble walking, if you have trouble seeing, say, AI systems can be a tremendous benefit, whereas uh, those of us who can see uh, need to worry about that less. Uh, he did not immediately um, cordon onto that and launch a moonshot project on AI and assistive <laughs> technology. He indicated that uh, he'd like to see a broader consensus than just me talking about it, and besides, uh, other parties perhaps constrain his ability to fund. But I was ready for that, and so I immediately turned to something that doesn't cost money, which is, um, but it does cost political will, which is um, immigration, right? We have a very difficult um, supply-side challenge with just not enough trained uh, workers, not enough PhDs, students who come here and can't stay, et cetera, et cetera. If we even restricted it to highly skilled workers in AI, students in AI, this would be a huge boon uh, to the industry. And uh, he, he told me that he'll get right to work on it and he'll solve this in the next 15 minutes. No, <laughs> I'm obviously mis, uh, misrepresenting that. But uh, that, that's, those are the two things I highlighted in my three minutes with the president. Uh, did international rivalry also come up in this? Y yes, it did. So uh, the whole session was about 90 minutes, and this was just my three minutes to speak uh, directly about my ideas. Uh, there is a lot of concern about that, and there are people there from National Security Council, Chief of Staff, uh, and so on. And I would say that how we are competing with China on all fronts, but certainly in AI and its implications for the economy, but also for national security is top of mind. So the, there's this uh, group of high profile scientists who wrote an open letter calling for a slowdown. Uh, that already also came up. What do, what do you think uh, about that? And please elaborate, take all the 30 minutes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, uh, what would a six month moratorium do other than it was mentioned earlier, uh, give a lead to our international uh, competitors who won't abide by it, or maybe help uh, Elon Musk, who's a signatory to that letter, uh, catch up with his own AI efforts uh, to the existing ones. Uh, nothing. Uh, n nothing gets, gets accomplished there. And uh, the letter was vague in so many ways. The only motivation that I can see for writing something like that is that it's symbolic. Okay, so it's not a specific policy proposal, but it's symbolic of the fact that we do feel uh, like things are moving uh, too fast. Uh, I just saw the statistic that 72% of Americans want AI to slow down and only 8% uh, 
uh, wanted to, to speed up. And so we have this feeling, now the question is, what do we do about it? How do we translate it, not to policy proposals, but again, as one of the speakers earlier said, to policy proposals that actually have a positive impact? Uh, I'll leave that to you. I'm not a, a policy expert, but I think you would agree with me that a six-month moratorium is not the most effective way to go. So, so how about the principles? Uh, that was also brought up, but let's, let's go into them. The, the White House brought these CEOs in from seven companies. It was a big press conference. They all said they'd uh, uh, voluntarily abide by these uh, safe AI, AI principles. Uh, what, what did you think of those principles? I, I think they're lovely. <laughs> <laughs> lovely principles. Can we get to work now? <laughs> Any of them that you liked in particular or, uh, or you didn't like in particular? Here are some... Um, yeah, I, I, I did like uh, some of the work on transparency, some of the work to uh, test something before you, you launch it. Uh, at the same time, uh, I would say that we need to make some important distinctions that were not made in that statement of principles that I would add. The first one is the distinction between AI research and AI deployment, right? Uh, I think research, there are many benefits to allowing research to proceed relatively unfettered. And when we've tried to regulate research like with stem cell research, it's had a very negative effect. So I would first make that distinction very, very um, clear in any, any regulations or principles. And then the second one is I would make a difference between regulating broad technology and regulating applications, right? So there are different applications that we should think about very seriously, say uh, AI weapons that kill people without human in the loop. Hmm. Um, there, there are other ones that are less dramatic, but, uh, but just as important. We should also uh, figure out who's, who's responsible uh, in, in various ways, right? So if ChatGPT persuades me to do something wrong or distributes instructions on how to create bioweapons, who's, who's, who's liable, who's responsible? I think all these are, are extremely important. Some of the other kind of vaguer principles, I just think uh, somebody ought to connect the dots more explicitly to outcomes, okay? So let's say we abide by this principle, then what? All right, I, I, we'll come back to the, the, the threats in a moment. I, I, um, your remark about deployment uh, makes you think about a lot of algorithms have already been deployed and AI is being deployed now, in a, uh, just now as we speak in a lot of parts of daily life. It is, it, to those who know it well, uh, you can see the AI already in a lot of the things we use. Um, uh, and so, sort of let's be practical for this audience. What does everybody need to know? Um, what does every college graduate need to know? How about every lawyer? Uh, uh, what, how about every lobbyist? Uh, um, what, what, I'm not sure what's most common in the room today. Um, what does everybody need to know? Uh, and, uh, about the things that are being deployed today? I think that everybody needs to know what the technology can and cannot do and what is a reasonable trajectory for it. So sometimes when you point out to people that the technology does not do nearly as much as it is hyped to do, uh, people say, oh yeah, but in six months or 12 months or <laughs> look how rapidly it's progressed in the last uh, 12 months, right? So. Uh, beware of extrapolating, uh, particularly along an exponential, right? We've had an exponential, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's going to continue that way. In fact, uh, I, I don't believe that it will, certainly not in the, in the very short term. So uh, I think people just need to understand what it can and cannot do. In addition to that, let me go out on a limb. Uh, when I was in college, we had a course that I helped to teach and it was a one-week course, and it was required for graduation. And that was a course to teach you how to write a computer program. Curious, how many people in this room know how to write a simple computer program? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. And I can assure those of you who don't, uh, in a few hours, uh, with me or with code.org, which has wonderful tools for that and other places as well, you can learn. It's just not that mysterious. I would go further that you could easily learn in another week or so some simple 
um, uses of AI, simple abilities to program it. And I think it's really important because it informs the opinions, okay? Uh, it's not something mysterious and effable that only techies could do. Everybody has the ability to do this. And even if you don't take me up on this, if you have kids, nephews, uh, nieces, I strongly encourage you to, to have them learn so that they don't come to this new world with this kind of shadow boxing feeling. There's some AI thing out there and it's going to take over. Certainly spending some time yourself, and I'm sure people have done that with ChatGPT or the equivalent, uh, is also uh, extremely important. So I would say that being empirical about it as opposed to conceptual, right? Because conceptually, I can sell you all kinds of things. Be empirical about it and understand what's going on. And the last thing I would add to bring to your set of tools is never trust an AI demo. And what, <laughs> what, what I mean yeah. by that is not don't trust it like check its sources. I actually mean something else. I mean that sometimes it'll do seemingly amazing things, particularly if it's being controlled by somebody else whose job it is to make it seem amazing. But if you kick the tires systematically, you'll also discover some of the weaknesses. So don't just go with uh, cherry-picked examples with the best case scenario or the worst case scenario. Uh, understand what, what the boundaries are and what the playing field is. Uh, I've employed at a university that requires every undergraduate to pass a swimming test before they can graduate. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, let's add to that every undergraduate should be able to write a simple program before they graduate, even the, even the English majors. So <laughs> it, it's remarkable. So this is, so when I was uh, in college, a good, gosh, I was going to say 20 years ago, but it's more like 40. Yeah. Uh, t time flies. Um, it was a requirement. That's yeah. why I was one of the computer people teaching the course to English majors who <laughs> delayed it until right before graduation, but they needed to do it to graduate. And guess what? They all learned, every single one. Nobody didn't graduate because of this. But they removed the requirement. As far as I know, very few, if any, colleges today have the requirement that to graduate, you have to be able to write uh, a computer program. But this kind of uh, lack of computer literacy is, is a huge problem. So, uh, what about a mid-career executive? N not to say that there are any of those in the room, but uh, uh, what would you suggest for them? Many can't take a week out of their lives to learn how to program. Um, well, I, I, I do disagree a little bit with that premise, right? Okay. Imagine that you're a mid-career executive, but you were illiterate, literally, right? You couldn't read. You've somehow made your way through there. Would you take a week off to learn to read? Um, I, I, I would I would encourage uh, that, and it doesn't take a week. Okay, <laughs> take 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 a day and see how far you can get with uh, with with the modern tools. No excuses. Tell them it's part of your job. There's on the job training, right? They teach you these right. workshops with dubious um, merit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've been to some of those. Yeah, um, during those workshops, put it on mute and learn to program. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's 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 lighten up. Uh, 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 let's lighten up. Uh, uh, we have a, a couple uh, questions uh, coming up, and let's let's just go to it. The AI apocalypse. Uh, go straight to the the lightest topic on our list. Uh, um, uh, so, so AI has found its way into a lot of uh, society, military weapons, and uh, and there are malicious actors. W what's happening? How how do you think about that? That also has come up, but yeah, you know, sure. you've worked in this area for a long time. How do you think about the benefits and the dangers? So, um, I also very related. I see in front of me a, a question anonymous three minutes ago. It makes sense to worry about AI-driven weapons that can kill, but people have an awful record killing accidentally or maliciously. Would AI be worse? So I, I want to make a few points here. The first one is that I do think that the right standard for judging AI isn't, is AI going to be uh, perfect or ideal, anything like that, but is how does AI compare to the status quo? And self-driving cars is a great example, right? We have 40,000 
uh, people dying each year on American highways, right, using these killing machines, we can reduce that with self-driven cars. They'll still kill some people, but far less. So that is the, the, the point of comparison. Are things going to be better or worse? Now, directly to the question, I do think it makes sense to worry about AI in this context for two big reasons. The first one is that it's a power tool. So you can kill people a lot more efficiently with, uh, with AI. Uh, I mean, AI-powered weapons. So I do think we have to worry about that. Secondly, the uh, compliance game really changes, right? So when people build nuclear weapons, uranium enrichment, it's a lot easier to track uh, what they're doing and so on. When people are using AI in various nefarious ways, right, it's, it's in a computer somewhere, much, much harder to track. So AI is changing the equation uh, in terms of cyber attacks, in terms of weapons. And what the, that means is that right now, there is an AI arms race. Um, going on, and it is it is worrying. Again, from my point of view, the only thing more worrying than the Pentagon and our military uh, building AI weapons is us not building them, but having our adversaries build them more effectively. Boy, light topic. Yeah, <laughs> light topic. Yeah. Uh, uh, wow, I'm, I'm not sure where to go with that. Uh, that's a that's a. That that is very worrying. Um, uh, all right, let's let's an, let's let's end what we plan to have a conversation. We'll go to questions. How about that? So let's end with my last question um, that was planned here. It, uh, you get you, you get the privilege, probably the joy of playing with a lot of frontier tools, um, and uh, some of them are toys and some of them are tools. Uh, for this audience. What's, what's your favorite new, new tool, new toy, and what would you recommend to everyone these days? Um, ha hands down, spending time with these uh, GPT tools, whether it's Google's or OpenAI's or other ones, is, again, completely essential and surprisingly uh, entertaining and actually helpful uh, in, in a number of ways. One of the things that OpenAI released very recently is something called code interpreter, which helps you if you're doing coding, but also helps with data analysis. So you can uh, upload data and ask it to analyze and manipulate it in various ways. So if you work with data, and I'm sure everyone here does in one way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. uh, take code interpreter for a spin. You have to make sure that you click the right options to unveil it on uh, uh, at OpenAI. The good news is you can do a Google search and it'll tell you exactly uh, how to do that. Huh, well, let's, let's open for questions. Uh, uh, see what, what's coming up. You can, you can call. Uh, I think, do, do you need a mic? Yeah. I'm coming. Yeah. He bravely sits in the front row. So. <laughs> so thanks very much. Really enjoyed this. Um, something that I've always been curious about is uh, you open this um, with this point about people kind of have this kind of fear of it because, you know, we don't know exactly what it's going to produce, right? It's kind of different than the older school stuff where there's an algorithm we know it's gonna, what it's going to do. The thing I've been curious about, though, is I think when people hear that, they have this tendency to then uh, animate the technology and, and view it as then it's some sentient being because we don't know what it's going to do, just like I don't know what another person's going to do at any given point in time. But I don't believe that's exactly how it works. And I was wondering if you could enlighten us on kind of what are the sources of the uncertainty? Is it because you don't know what the data will be that's training it? Is it doing some probabilistic uh, draws from distributions when it's creating its response? What is the source of the uncertainty in what the tool is producing? It's a, w a wonderful question. And I want to go back to something that was written more than 40 years ago by Herb Simon who bridges the fields of computer science, also Nobel laureate in economics. And he had a metaphor, a parable, that was called Simon's Ant. How many people here have heard of Simon's Ant? OK, so you learn. Uh, all of you except this gentleman will learn something new today. So Herb Simon said, what if you take an ant walking along the beach and you drew its trajectory, its path on uh, graph paper? What you would see, or in three dimensions, right, if this was a more modern uh, version of this, you would see an extremely complex and unpredictable 
trajectory for what is ultimately a very, very simple reactive mechanism. That's exactly what's happening with AI. It's entirely a function of its reaction to its input, which in this case is the training data and the questions that, it, that it's being asked, what's called the prompts. So you're right, it is somewhat uncertain, certainly unpredictable, but it's entirely a function of what it's fed, just like uh, Simon's ant. Um, yeah, I, I mean, following up on the question, also we've been asked anonymously, does, does that require a different kind of computer literacy to understand that? Um, so sophistication with the concepts of computers has always been much more important than knowing how to code in a particular language. I taught computer science for 20 years. The students would always come in and it's like, I gotta learn the particulars of the latest technology. It's gonna help me get a job at <laughs> this place and so on and let's get down to business. And I said, this is not a vocational school. The languages will change, even the concepts will change. I'm gonna teach you the fundamental ideas and techniques to withstand the test of time that you can then apply in different contexts. So the question was, is pseudocoding or kind of more being able to structure program more important than coding in a particular language? It always has been. Hi, I, I'm, I'm the other Shane at the conference. Um, <laughs> so actually on the point of vocation, how do we get to start to democratize AI and lower it down into the community colleges and high school and the education point? Because I think that's part of it. I mean, all this is, is very interesting and I think we need to go faster rather than slower on a lot of this, but any thoughts you have on how we really get it out there beyond the higher institutions? I have a very uh, concrete suggestion. So what I described is uh, l literacy, right, which is different. And you're saying we need to go beyond that, and you're absolutely right, right? Uh, particularly younger people need to go way beyond that. I think it's a combination of improving our online resources, which is happening very rapidly, and it's the easiest to do. Code.org code, uh, just launched uh, an AI sequence, Khan Academy, all, all these places have increasingly oh. powerful tools. But the second thing is, will take longer, but is essential, is improve the teacher training, right? Most of the teachers that I encounter um, don't know the basics of what they really ought to be teaching. And so they gravitate and agitate and do various things to teach what they want to be teaching, because the, otherwise they'll be out of a job. Um, that's a real shame. All right, one, one more. Uh, uh, you get to pick. Please. Uh, okay. so I, I was overruled. But <laughs> yeah. so it, it, this is, I believe, more than a comment that it, it got me thinking, okay, learn to code. Do you really need to learn to code when we have ChatGPT now and you can ask ChatGPT to code something for you? Or in the future, would, would you need to learn how to drive if the car is going to drive? So I, I think at some point, it's going to switch to how to use these tools effectively rather than fight against them. That's a wonderful point. And let me, let me um, just clarify what I said, because I actually agree with you 100%. Learn to code is always using existing tools, right? So we used to code, and I'm old enough to have done this, code using what's called machine code and assembly, very, very primitive. Uh, and now we code using high-level languages. Learn to code, you can certainly use GPT to help you learn to code, but it's not as simple as take the problem, give it to chat GPT, cut and paste the answer, and we're done. N not, not at all the case. You have to test what came back, you have to do a few other things. So you have to often clarify the, the question, so, right? So uh, I would modify it, completely agree with you. Learn to code using the most cutting edge tools available. Well, I, I can see more questions, but we'll, you can take them during the break and ask uh, Dr. Etzioni on your own. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us and uh, look forward to seeing you. Thank you, thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thanks so much, that was really a great conversation. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Okay, we're gonna take a 15 minute break now. Um, don't forget about the Tech yeah. Hub there, you can get good coffee. Be back here at 10.30, and we actually have a way to make up the lost time over lunch, and we will. Um, so, 